Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for responding. That means everybody's had coffee. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Mike Sfrag. I'm the director of the Polar Initiative at the Woodrow Wilson Center. It's an honor to have this morning's uh, panelists and speakers with us. Uh, as many of you know, uh, we're here in the auditorium. I'm uh, going to focus on uh, the National Guard's role in the Arctic and cold weather operations. But I want to thank you all for coming, but also the many that are online this morning watching this. This is being recorded, so you can go back and, and look at the program, and it will be rebroadcast as well. Many familiar faces. Thank you again. Uh, many of you know that this has been uh, the Wilson Center's month of the Arctic from May 29th through June 29th. We've celebrated a lot of programs here, and there's been wonderful response both here in the auditorium, uh, online, and then in many follow-up discussions and meetings. On the 29th of May, we worked with our friends at the uh, Finnish Embassy, and we explored the common solutions in Arctic meteorology, part of the Finnish chairmanship. On June 8th, we hosted uh, RAND Europe and USA, where they unveiled their program on the future of the Arctic cooperation in a changing environment. Just three days later, on June 11th, with our uh, colleagues at the Royal Norwegian Embassy in D.C. and Arctic Frontiers, we hosted Norway's ambassador and Senator Murkowski, where we discussed space technology for a smart and resilient Arctic. On the 20th of June, just reading this, I'm tired. On the 20th of June, <laughs> we hosted uh, Minister Plenipotentiary uh, and Head of Representation for Greenland at the Danish Embassy, Mr. Inutek Olsen, who spoke to us about his perspectives on the future of Greenland and un, uh, unveiled our intent to work with them to create the Greenland Dialogues. On the 21st of June, uh, Lynn Platt, the State Department, uh, and she works here at the Center's Canada Institute, led for us a ground truth briefing of approximately 100 people online from all over the world that looked at energy innovation in remote and Arctic communities, which leads us to today, the final program in our month of the Arctic. The National Guard interests in the Arctic, Arctic extreme cold weather capabilities. The program and subsequent discussion will include general officers representing the National Guard's Arctic Interest Council. I want to make a special note uh, of the leadership, support, and incredible effort uh, demonstrated by Lieutenant Colonel Adam Negri of the Alaska National Guard. Thank you, Colonel, for the incredible support in putting this all together. We appreciate it here at the Wilson Center. I also want to thank Michael Johnson, the Special Assistant for the Alaska Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, for his support in making today possible. And as always, my associate, Jack Durkee, who makes all things happen here in terms of the polar work that we do. So today's program will unfold as follows. There will be not a keynote presentation, I am told, by, Major, by General Hummel. There will be a presentation on the National Guard's Arctic Interest Council. Uh, we will have questions and answers between me and the panel and then we'll open it up for questions and answers with the audience as well. So to begin the morning's program, it's a pleasure to introduce our key presenter, we'll call it that, <laughs> Major General Lori Hummel, the Adjutant General of Alaska. I am told not to read her bio, but I will read a sentence or two of her bio, because you simply need to have some context here. Major General Hummel is the Adjutant General of the Alaska National Guard and the Commissioner of the Alaska Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. Was that short enough, General? Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Please welcome General Hummel. So, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mike, and, and thank you all for attending when uh, m probably most people are headed out of town right now for a long, hot weekend away from the big city. Uh, let me downgrade expectations a little bit more and just say that I have some remarks uh, to kick off what I think uh, would be a, an interesting and lively discussion about um, why we have formed the National Guard Arctic Interest Council. Um, and I want to say also that um, I really feel at home here in the Wilson Center. I um, am a recovering academic and uh, was the director of the geography program um, at West Point for a number of years. And I worked uh, collaboratively for quite a while with Jeff DeBelco uh, from the Environmental Change and Security Program. <clears throat> and I was able to see Jeff uh, last year out in Columbus, Ohio. And he looked uh, not stressed at all uh, trying to negotiate the lack of traffic uh, there. So <clears throat> there are... Um, many kindred spirits here in, uh, in the Woodrow Center, and so the Wilson Center. So thank you so much for, for meeting with us this morning. 
So uh, what is the National Guard Arctic Interest Council? And in a nutshell, it's uh, comprised of executive leadership and uh, subject matter experts in homeland security and homeland defense from 18 of the 54 National Guard states. And so uh, Alaska, of course, uh, has a, a, a prominent role in starting and, and standing up the Arctic Interest Council, as, as well we should, being America's um, Arctic state. And our co-chair, uh, or vice chair, this, uh, for this first two years of this organization is uh, the state of Maine. And we just met, we were, were coming off of a, a meeting uh, in Maine where we developed objectives and a plan uh, for how we're going to uh, spend our efforts over the next uh, couple of years. So basically we are an association of states and we've come together to, to help solve problems related to war fighting and domestic response in a cold weather environment. <clears throat> and I should also uh, note right up front what we're not. Uh, what we're not are official spokespersons of the Department of Defense. So don't let the uniforms fool you. Uh, we are Army and Air Force officers, but, uh, but we are representing the several states of the National Guard. So we represent the concerns of our states, um, of, of our governors, the philosophies of our governors, and ourselves as military leaders of, of men and women in uniform. What we're also not uh, is experts in the Arctic, but what we are are students of the Arctic. <clears throat> uh, and we know that Arctic peoples and Arctic environments and economics and resources and national interests as they compete or coincide um, are, are important. And we feel have uh, the, the, the time is ripe, perhaps overripe, uh, for our nation to have a coherent, uh, overarching, well-defined Arctic strategy and for a defense strategy that, that is wise and helps to develop resources to face the ongoing, uh, the, the developing uh, concerns in the Arctic is, is paramount. So <clears throat> what are some of those concerns um, in the Arctic? First and foremost in our minds uh, are, are the fact, is the fact that we have um, at least two peer or near peer competitors who are assertively developing uh, cold weather and Arctic capabilities while uh, our Arctic um, capabilities and defense uh, have, have been stagnant or um, arguably have atrophied. So look, nobody wants to think about militarization of the Arctic, right? <clears throat> but the fact is there, there is no treaty and militarization of ungoverned space can be seen um, as inevitable uh, if we don't put attention to it. And uh, Russia, Alaska's neighbors to the west, are expanding uh, assertively and, and quickly expanding its basing and its permanent presence, uh, as well as its ability to project forces. What kind of forces? Icebreakers. <clears throat> now, I'm not a naval officer. I'll use the technical term, a whole flotilla of them, uh, up to about 40 uh, heavy icebreakers. Tw more than 12 new airfields all above the Arctic Circle, 16 deep water ports, 20-ish air defense radar sites, and a, a broad range of their best uh, tactical and, and long-range air defense artillery systems dedicated cold weather training, training centers. They are actively deploying valuable and scarce combat brigades and paratroop units and electronic warfare units and counterterrorism forces. And uh, all of this is being tied together coherently with the creation of a new Arctic Strategic Command. China has... Uh, aspirations of, of being an Arctic stakeholder. 
and uh, and their activities are are lower key, uh, but they do have key interests to include securing access of um, at a reasonable cost to the opening Arctic shipping lanes, to include um, strengthening their ability as a non-Arctic state to access resources, and specifically fishing waters. We don't expect that they'll make any claim of sovereignty. They're uh, respectful of sovereignty, but we know that China wants to be a part of the Arctic order, and they want to influence the discussions and the decisions on how the Arctic should be governed. So they are keen to become a permanent observer to the Arctic Council, and so they are definitely an aspirational force in the Arctic. So we recognize um, in our northern tier states that there are gaps, perhaps giant gaps, in our capability that would prevent us from performing our wartime or domestic support missions in extreme cold weather environments or in Arctic locations. <clears throat> and some of the other panelists will talk specifically about the, uh, the, the things that we're trying to address. We know that we need to be able to sustain forces in extreme cold weather, and that means the right clothing, the right equipment, uh, the right training, proper funding for exercises. We know that that means being able to mount effective uh, chemical, biological, radiological, and, and nuclear responses in a cold environment, which is extraordinarily difficult. We know that we have to have modernized equipment, and we know that uh, our attention as, uh, as the defense effort has been um, in Southwest Asia. It has been in other locations, certainly not the Arctic. Uh, we're no longer properly equipped to, uh, we, we don't even have the necessary clothing uh, as individuals to operate in, in extreme cold weather for extended periods of time without significant risk of in injury. There's some good news, <clears throat> and that is that uh, our bilateral partner in, uh, in NORAD, uh, Canada, they have not only begun, or they not only have recognized um, that we need to have uh, defense movement toward um, sovereign security, but they're putting their money where their mouth is. So uh, in the last year, they have announced uh, a lot of uh, improvements and increases in communications infrastructure, uh, more pervasive uh, surveillance, a more uh, permanent presence, and a new um, energy toward deterring and defend, defending their Arctic sovereignty. So the time is right, uh, we believe, uh, in the world of Department of Defense to, uh, to have this conversation because our forces uh, in the Army and the Air Force are in the process of rebooting in a way. Um, we're focusing under our national leadership on modernization and recapitalization. And uh, as the Department of Defense develops requirements for the next generation of equipment, we want to make sure uh, that we partner effectively to, uh, to, to guide those efforts. And so we come to this collaboration with a, um, a determination that uh, we, we want to have a collaborative voice. We want to actively partner with our resourcing headquarters, National Guard Bureau, and with other uh, leaders in Department of Defense, and also with policymakers to make sure that um, we are ready for, to prosecute effectively all of our homeland security and our homeland defense uh, missions in the Arctic. And so I don't want to take any more air time. There's a really big clock back there reminding me that I'm now stealing precious seconds from the other panel members. And so I'll, uh, I'll sit back and let them cover all the things I forgot to say. Thank you, General.
We appreciate it. As, uh, as you've noticed, we have many officers here on the stage, so let me introduce each of them. And then I'm going to ask uh, a few questions, uh, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience uh, to, for follow-up. Uh, we have front-row commentators that I will uh, introduce uh, at, at the appropriate time. And so we hope that this is an engagement as, as much as it is a, a question and answer between me and our panelists. So let me first start with uh, introducing Major General Douglas Farnham, the Adjutant General of the Maine U.S. National, US uh, uh, National Guard. Uh, he is uh, joined by Brigadier General David Wood, Director of Joint Staff, Joint Forces Headquarters, U.S. National Guard. Brigadier General Sean O'Brien, Assistant Adjutant General, New Hampshire, Joint Force Headquarters. Brigadier General Lowell Cruz, Assistant Adjutant General, uh, Joint Forces, um, Minnesota. Uh, and then I believe final participant is uh, Major General Don Dunbar, the Adjutant General from Wisconsin. Have I included all of us today? I'm Not every, very good pleased job, Mike. with that. that. <laughs> I feel so out of place on this stage right now. <laughs> that was the hard part. <laughs> the good thing is we have name tags. We that's always know very helpful. To. That's very helpful. And I'm really happy to be sitting next to a fellow geographer. And I will tell you that uh, Jeff DeBelco's legacy is, is, lives on in this building. Many of his uh, staff and colleagues are here in this audience today. Wonderful. So you're, you're very much at home. Let me start the first question here then uh, with General Dunbar. Uh, as General Hummel noted, uh, the Guard's interest in, in this area, but I think it would be helpful for many of us to get a better understanding as to what is the National Guard, what makes it different. You have a broad mission, uh, and then how that mission folds into uh, the issues that um, General uh, Hummel noted, which is the Arctic uh, and also cold climate weather-related operations. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's, a, it's an honor to be with you. I appreciate the invitation from the Wilson Center and a chance to uh, be part of this uh, council, um, which was uh, formulated uh, by my colleague on the right, did a great job, and I appreciate that. Uh, so uh, I'll start also uh, with a disclaimer that I'm here as the uh, Adjutant General, the Commanding General of the Wisconsin National Guard in a state status, representing the state of Wisconsin, uh, not representing the Defense Department, and nobody's approved my comments from the Defense Department. In general, uh, the National Guard is a wonderful uh, American organization uh, we are uh, constitutionally unique. We are the primary combat reserve of our United States Army and our United States Air Force when we are on active duty. And when we're not on active duty, we are the first military responder and homeland and a state military force that the American public through the federal government invests uh, billions of dollars to make sure that we are trained uh, to perform our federal missions, both for the Army and the United States Air Force. So each of us could go through uh, the force structure that we have in our states and, and what the Army or the Air Force thinks they need in a combat reserve perspective. And a corollary of that is that uh, you get some wonderful capability that's available to the governor should he or she need to call out the National Guard for uh, an emergency within the state. So broadly, you can uh, call out the National Guard uh, under the Militia Clause of the Constitution. We're actually seeing part of that right now on the southwest border as the President has called out the National Guard as the National Guard under the Governor's command and control to do a mission on the southwest border, as opposed to Congress using its raise an army power in a different part of the Constitution when we get mobilized for uh, federal missions, and which we have done multiple, multiple times uh, since uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and, and most assuredly since 911. When we go overseas, uh, when the National Guard uh, really is in just about every uh, major muscle movement that the Army or the Air Force does. So two broad roles, primary combat reserve, first military responder in the homeland. Uh, I think a good way to think about uh, those two roles, we can look at uh, the recently released National Military Strategy from our Secretary of Defense, who talked uh, broadly in terms of the shifting landscape as General Hummel mentioned about um, a, uh, not that we're not focused on the war on terror as a country, but we're also looking at near-peer competitors. Uh, you can read the unclassified version of this uh, um, strategy, very well written, and broad strategies get put into that uh, in terms of readiness, lethality of our forces, and then building partnerships uh, for whatever may come for our country. And so uh, we have as we think about things like the Arctic, we think about that aspect as an adjutant general. We also think about our state missions, uh, that first military responder and homeland, which include 
depending on the state, uh, different roles in addition to being the commander of the National Guard. So in my state as an example, and if you've seen one state, you've seen one state. Uh, I'm responsible for emergency management in my state. I'm responsible for homeland security in my state as Governor Walker's homeland security advisor. And I'm also, believe it or not, although I assure you I do not speak dolphin, I am the senior state official for cyber matters. Because of a clearance and because of a relationship with Department of Homeland Security and DOD, that was a good fit for our state. Different states do it differently. So when we think about extreme cold weather operations, we think about potential operations in the Arctic as our country sets that course um, from the National Military Command Authority and from the national elected officials, how might that fit the National Guard? And well, we think about it from, uh, it fits both of our state missions. One, we have that federally funded state mission to train. So as we train, we don't want to just train for the fight that we've been involved in these last 20 years, always going to the Middle East, where it's warm, in some cases very warm, but we need to think about other places where we might have to go and being able to fight uh, as our Army and the Air Force think about fighting in an all uh, weather environment is important for the National Guard to think about it as, as well. And so we think about that as adjutants general. We also think about it from a possible state response. If you're a northern tier state like Wisconsin, it may not get Arctic cold, but it gets pretty darn cold in Wisconsin. And we've had plenty of responses in the winter where it's been a brutal, uh, well below zero temperatures. When you throw the wind chill in, you're into the minus double digits. And we have roads and lines of communication that have to be kept, op kept open. So our ability to respond in that environment is very important to us. Uh, we also think about it from a, an emergency management assistance compact, which is a law in our country that allows a governor to help a governor. And as General Hummel said, Alaska being the true Arctic state of the 50 states in the United States, there could be a day when the governor of Alaska reaches out for help, and we'd certainly like to be able to fulfill that need. And thinking about that, maybe exercising it, doing things in the future that would make us more able to do that is certainly high on my list uh, as an adjutant general. And the last point, and this kind of gets to the EMAC point that I'll make, is when we think about that partnership uh, lane that the secretary outlined, uh, which is not a new thought, but he, he definitely crystallized it for us. That's something that the National Guard does <clears throat> every day. We have wonderful relationships with our sheriffs, with our chiefs of police, with our firefighters, with most every department, uh, whether it's the FBI or Homeland Security, Department of Defense in the state that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, but also our state partners. And so that partnership role, uh, if it's an issue for a state like Alaska, who might really be the first folks there, it could be an issue for all of us, and it's in our interest to think about it and how we might uh, get after it, and that's how we're going to try and partner, or why we're going to try and partner uh, with the leadership of our National Guard Bureau to try and bring those aspects into the future and maybe chart a course as we go forward. Uh, perhaps we can talk later about different things where we've done that in the past. But I'll stop there and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, General. To just pick up from what Don said, EMAC means uh, Emergency Management Assistance Compact. And so basically it's agreements that states make with one another that you know when we have a, a, a big emergency and we're tapped out on resources, we can go to Wisconsin and ask them to send us stuff and we want that stuff to be articulately appropriate in order to help Alaskans. So that would be one Governor Walker reaching out to help the other Governor Walker. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, Generals. <clears throat> so uh, my next question, uh, perhaps of General Cruz, if I might. So I can understand why Alaska, maybe even Wisconsin, are interested in the Arctic and, and cold weather uh, operations and they're interested in, in formulating this council, but why are other states, Minnesota, Colorado, Pennsylvania, interested in the Arctic and the formation of an Arctic interest council, understanding full well we're also talking about cold weather operations? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the heart of it, Mike. Um, as General Dunbar talked a little bit, um, we're Arctic, you know, northern tier states in the United States operate in extreme cold weather. Um, Minnesota. I'm, re I'm reminded of that every January and February when the when the when the, the when the wind currents change from the north and the Arctic hits central Minnesota and we operate, you know, for weeks at 20 below zero and in conditions that are extreme cold. And um, we routinely operate there and we routinely put our soldiers out 
and deploy them to either train or to conduct um, winter rescue missions and things like that. So understanding how to operate in that environment, I think as individuals, our soldiers do do that. But I think um, the as we discussed this week as part of the Arctic Interest Council, we're very concerned that as an Army and as a Department of Defense, we um, are have let our skill set of how to operate at larger formations at Tropy. Um, just as our skill set and the, the military's reverting back to training on major combat operations after a lot of stability operations, um, we have let skill sets that we had in our in our toolbox in the 80s and 90s a trophy a little bit on how to operate and survive in extreme cold weather environments. Um, became very concerning as, you know, we looked at potential op having to operate in Korea and things like that as a military here this last six mm -hmm. months. And I think it's very important that um, we help the Department of Defense and the Army um, focus some of its effort on um, research and development of tactics and techniques that allow us to operate in, in extreme cold weather. But I think more importantly, what Minnesota or Colorado bring to the table is relationships. Um, the Minnesota National Guard's had a relationship with the country of Norway for about 45 years. We do a mill-to-mill um, -mill bilateral exchange with that country's home guard, which is their version of the National Guard. Um, what that gives us is um, relationships throughout the government of, of Norway and um, specifically in their military, because their military is much different than the Guard and the fact that their officers flow in and out of their Home Guard back into their active component and back into their Ministry of Defense. So um, my Adjutant General, myself, we have relationships with leaders in Norway that we can touch back to gain, you know, mentoring. You know, this last week I've been in contact with the head of the Norwegian Home Guard as we talked about issues at the Arctic Interest Council just to get his perspective on if we're talking about the right things. Um, so I think that's important. Um, if you look at the Colorado example, Colorado's got part of their National Guard is embedded in NORTHCOM. NORTHCOM and, and, and UCOM have the mission of helping defend the Arctic regions. So I think um, Colorado brings a unique um, connectivity back into NORTHCOM that we as the National Guard need to help utilize as an influencer um, and then, you know, there, we have other interests. Um, Minnesota used to be a state where you would send soldiers to do um, extreme cold weather winter training. Um, Colorado still is that. They have their high altitude training center in the mountains. And so I think um, you, you look at countries that are a long ways away from the Arctic Circle, but I think you can still find interests there that parallel and add to this council's efforts. I'm struck, uh, thinking back on um, past research in, in a past life, thinking about the narrative up uh, to World War II, when the Quartermaster Corps was caught, now having to fight a global war. And I'm struck by the same thing just a few years later, the Korean War, where we found ourselves in a particular equipment deficit and, and training deficit. And this forward-leaning effort by this council uh, to me is r really a good sign because history has taught us a few things and when we don't train, when we don't prepare, we don't think over the horizon, this nation sometimes gets caught off guard. We, we have the blessing of catching up quickly, but it takes a lot of effort and the effort of, of the leadership at this panel. So I'm just struck by history perhaps not repeating itself. And, and our, our soldiers suffer while we catch up. Yeah. So that's what we as leaders need to try to avoid. Yeah. So. And the catch up period is uh, not only painful for the military, but it's also at the expense of everything else we need to be doing concurrently. Yeah, thank you. Well, let me just follow up then on that with uh, General O'Brien, if you don't mind. So, it's a question on, on uh, national security. So, how are the National Guard's operational expertise and related capacity uh, to operate in the Arctic and in extreme cold weather conditions important to our national security? Again, Mike, thanks for being here. Appreciate the time. My, my fellow peer generals here. Um, so a couple things I wrote down here. You said national security and then operational experience. So first, national security. There's a December 2017, 55-page document that talks about 
wide ranging areas that the U.S. military are working. The theme from that is com compete, deter, win. Compete, deter, win. So we, if you look at what we've talked about here so far, as far as what can the Guard bring to the table, um, one of the things I want to mention is our people. Uh, I think one of our treasures is, is the, the airmen and the soldiers of the National Guard. Um, I'm going to use a term and use myself in a, as an example. I'm what's called a traditional guardsman. Um, the term also is out there called M-Day. What that basically means is for three decades I've had two careers. This career presently wearing this uniform and I, I work in sales in my civilian job. And that's probably 80 to 90 percent of our force. And as General Cruz had mentioned, Operationally, we live in our environments, Minnesota, New Hampshire, Maine, Pennsylvania, Alaska. And what, what does that bring? The operational experience of having trained over decades together as a force. Um, I can just give an example as a commander of the Army Guard, New Hampshire, in our artillery units, we've got soldiers, NCOs, and officers, warrant officers that have degrees from many institutions, a lot with three letters, that have done very well in their 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 procedures and, and how they've helped our units um, excel at our annual training events. So I think the national security piece, you know, compete, deter, win, the people that the Arctic Interest Council can bring together, which is the airmen and soldiers, that's, um, that's really our value. And just one last thing I want to mention here before I move on, the state partnership program also in, in the Guard has been around for decades. Uh, General Cruz had mentioned what his state does with Minnesota bilateral agreements, Alaska state partnership program with Mongolia, trade relationships with Canada, Colorado works a state partnership program with Slovenia, Michigan has uh, trade, uh, yeah, trade relations with Denmark, they train with Denmark rather, mm -hmm. um, and my state, New Hampshire and Maine, we both work with the, the northern Canadian provinces, and th those relationships and the stakeholders that we all interact with is one of the key pieces of this, of this council. And I'll just close with this last thought. Um, Major General Hummel mentioned it. Ungoverned spaces will eventually be governed. And what the council can do is help provide a presence and activity in that region through training with our soldiers and our airmen to assist the military in, in meeting the long-term goals, which will eventually assist in our national security strategy. Thank you. Thank you. So let me, this is, thank, thank you all for allowing me to then bridge into other questions. This is really great. So let me, let me ask General Wood. Uh, what does the National Guard Arctic Interest Council see uh, as your top challenge, but it sounds like these are challenges. What, what challenges do you face going forward? Right. I, I think, you know, we, we've talked about the security and sovereignty issues that, that certainly, uh, require, I believe, a, a presence, a, a consistent presence. And what the National Guard does bring to the table is just that. I mean, we have our hometown armories. Um, they're spread throughout the state of Alaska, but certainly spread across the northern tier of the, 40, of the lower 48. Um, that ability allows us, again, whether it's a, in a domestic operations response, it allows that EMAC process to take place where we can quickly and rapidly um, put our soldiers into Alaska or into the, into the, the northern tier, the Arctic area, um, to, to have that presence. When you look at the opening up of the Arctic Oceans, when you look at the opening up of the region, you see, you know, tourism growing. You see, you see uh, uh, the economic things growing, transportation, uh, the, uh, the, you know, mining, all different types of, of economic factors. They're all bringing people to the Arctic. Uh, when you have people, you know, the National Guard takes on a very, very important role in that ability to provide domestic response. And in order to do that, in the lower 48, the, the National Guard has programs such as the Homeland Response Force. We have programs such as civil support teams. These are all very quick, rapid reaction organizations that can respond to all types of, of, of events, you know, Suburney type events. Um, we also have cyber folks that can respond quickly to the needs, you know, election security needs, um, uh, you know, economic, uh, you know, um, 
you know, intrusion type things that happen through cyber. So the guard provides this very quick, rapid response. So I think one of our biggest challenges is to be able to formalize that process, to be able to allow that equipment, those capabilities, those personnel that, we, that work in this business fairly regularly, in fact, almost every day in many cases, um, to be able to move quickly and respond quickly to the needs that, that, are, that, that um, um, we see in the Arctic. So, um, you know, when we looked at, we just had Arctic Eagle uh, this, past, this past year, where we looked at moving the Homeland Response Force out of California uh, to Alaska. And we saw some of the challenges we have with moving those, that, that capability. We need to c continuously uh, um, understand, evaluate, and see what we need to do to be able to make that, make that situation better, to be able to respond quicker, to be more rapidly responsive to those needs. So again, it's just working on those, those things that we do in the lower 48, making sure in the National Guard we can bring that up to Alaska uh, or wherever else we're required to go. Thank you very much. Uh, General Farnham, let me uh, link then two, two related questions. One has to do with uh, what do you th believe to be the most pressing mission requirements going forward? And then the second is what do you need from the various communities? And by communities, I'd like to make that as broad as possible for you, whether it's local or communities in the, in the Department of Defense or however you'd like to take those two. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. The, uh, I mean, I think... I mean, you've heard most of the issues already touched on at this point, um, but really it's a mindset. Um, and, you know, we in the Guard, uh, we live in the North, a lot of us. Uh, we operate in the cold. Um, we have, uh, we talk about near-peer competitors. We talk about North Korea and being able to be ready and, and improve our readiness and our lethality as we're uh, expected to do when we provide federal forces. Uh, but. Uh, we have the other side where we're doing the homeland defense and, and responding to disasters. So we have a, a different requirement. So it's a mindset that we need to be ready and that we need to think about it. And so the Arctic Interest Council, one of the things and one of our missions is to really uh, provide people that are thinking about it and people that are become subject matter experts on some of these issues. So when we're talking about equipment and training that's required, or sustaining uh, operations in that environment, that we have people that are, that are thinking about it, that are planning, that are exercising, uh, that are coming up with new uh, techniques and procedures to be able to, uh, to do that mission right. And so, again, it's a mindset to go back to say, hey, somebody, while everybody else is looking somewhere else, that uh, there's, a, there's a group of folks that are paying attention to the, uh, to the polar region and the Arctic and the extreme cold weather operations. And uh, we think because of that dual uh, capability that we need to provide, that the Guard is a uh, perfect place to do that. Um, but we can't do it, you know, we can't do it by our, our, ourselves, and it takes a lot of partners. And one of the things that the Guard prides itself is our partnerships and the fact that we work with um, other countries, we work with the services, we work with Department of Homeland Security, we work with our state agencies, and so we have all these partnerships and we can communicate uh, these issues and these problems and these obstacles, we can communicate with them um, maybe better than anybody else can. And we hope that we, uh, as we learn, that it will be better. You know, just uh, simple things with, with Congress, being able to talk about what the needs are and, and how things like uh, continuing resolutions and uncertain budgets affect some of this planning and equipping that we need to do. Um, you know, it's Homeland Security and it's the Coast Guard and it, you know, planning and uh, scheduling exercises that we can fold in on and, uh, and improve our position. Um, it's, acad it's academics. It's, uh, uh, there's a lot of issues in the Arctic, as you all know. Uh, there's, uh, you know, geopolitical issues, there's environmental issues, there's human issues. Uh, it's a lot more than just military. So um, we think that all of those coming together, uh, we're in a good position to do that. Uh, and so we're all more informed and, and uh, can, uh, can make, a, make a difference in the Arctic. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, let me just introduce to you a few other individuals that are in the front row here uh, for, for their comments, but also open it up to a question, question and answer as well. So the first person I want to introduce uh, is Sherry Goodman, who's our senior fellow in the Polar Initiative and Environmental Change and Security Program. 
many of you know Sherry, so I won't ask her to, to stand up and, and wave. Uh, second is Colonel Michelle Kilgore, 109th Airlift Wing Commander out of New York, correct? My home state. Lieutenant Colonel Adam Negri, Deputy Strategic Plans and Policy Officer, Alaska National Guard. Chief Warrant Officer David Cheney, he's Command Chief Warrant Officer for the State of Maine. Brigadier General Dwayne Drummond, Director of the Joint Staff, Maine. Lieutenant Colonel Aaron Kelsey, Alaska National Guard, J-5. And Colonel Tom Bolin, Alaska National Guard, J-3, State Director of Operations. Tom, thank you very much. And thank you all for being here. So I think this is a really good time to uh, thank you all for your service to this nation, um, not, just, not just from the Arctic or a cold climate perspective, but thanking you for allowing us to do what we do, which is live our lives knowing others have our back. Thank you very much. We appreciate it very much. Uh, with that, let me open it up to either comments from our front row experts, if there are any. Okay, I'm sure that will change. Yep. Uh, but Sherry, Sherry has a comment. Wonderful. Um, Jack Durkee, my, my associate from the Polar Initiative here, has a microphone. And then others, please uh, prepare your, your questions in the question format. Thank you very much. Sherry? Yeah, thank you all for being here and uh, for sharing your, your time, your commitment to duty and service to the nation uh, with all of us. Um, we, we deeply, deeply appreciate it. Um, I, I respect deeply that you have formed this National Guard uh, Arctic Interest Council, and I think it's very timely. Um, just to sort of put in, in perspective, um, going back at over a decade now when uh, we formed the CNA Military Advisory Board on Climate Change and National Security, we observed with a group of a dozen senior retired military leaders and former chiefs of staff of, of uh, the Army and uh, Air Force and, and combatant commanders that the U.S. is not prepared to operate in a changing Arctic. Uh, and so I'm glad that you have taken up that charge. I observe that Secretary of Defense Mattis has said that climate change is affecting us where our forces are deployed today. And he recently said, as I'm sure you all know, that we need to up our game in the Arctic. Mm -hmm. So you're part of that. You're part of helping us uh, up our game in the Arctic. So I'd like to ask you um, how you, and this is part of, in, in many ways, I think our responsibility to prepare, to prepare to operate in, in a changing uh, geostrategic environment. You mentioned you know, the ungoverned spaces and the challenges we face in ungoverned spaces, implying that obviously parts of the Arctic are today ungoverned. Um, uh, and there's both the near peer competitor threat of potentially Russia, China, North Korea, for which we are already deploying extensively forces uh, in Alaska and beyond. Uh, then there's the sort of new challenges, the more the homeland security challenges of potential illegal trafficking, um, illicit, you know, activities and threats to, direct threats to the, to the homeland, but not necessarily from a, a, a peer competitor. Then there are the risks kind of associated with more activity in the, in the Arctic of spills and, and accidents, as you noted on your, um, on your chart here. So, I wondered if you could break down for us how you think about now that you have formed as a group, how do you, how are you, uh, one, interfacing with the active duty forces to assess what are the actual requirements, how do you prioritize among this long list uh, for funding, and what is what's in the middle box there, what you see as sort of the most immediate prioritized needs, and then that's what you will collectively across the force um, look to, see, to seek to prioritize. And then finally, if you would share a little bit more about this interesting Arctic Eagle exercise and sort of what, what's your top line coming out of that? What do we need better to be able to, uh, you know, e within the next, within the fit up, within the next five years, operate uh, successfully in the Arctic against the range of threats that you now identify? Cherry, thank oh, you. Thank for you, Sherry. Sorry, please, thank you for both please. of those questions. I knew they were coming to us, so um, so I'd like to ask the, the real experts here from an operational standpoint who work with us every day, um, our, our J-5, our Chief and Deputy of uh, Plans and Policy and also Director of Operations, so um, Adam slash Aaron, 
Um, if, if one of you can, can talk about our, our major um, initiatives going forward, and then Tom, if you're comfortable talking about Arctic Eagle and the lessons learned and, and how we um, wish to develop the Arctic Eagle exercise series going forward. Over the past week in Maine, we had we brought together a group of, of people, of experts in uh, just what we do. And just by the virtue of where we live, experts in mm -hmm. cold weather and Arctic. And we, we, what we try to do is, is tackle the problem. What are the problems uh, that we need to solve in order to be able to respond, compete, deter, and, and win? And we, when, when we broke it down, we saw it into really, really three areas. The first me being being able to operate effectively in, in cold weather. The second is looking at being able to deploy in, and uh, sustain in an extremely, extremely remote and austere uh, environments. And uh, the third is, is just getting there over the, uh, over, over the vast distances. So uh, in looking at those problems, uh, we, we looked at uh, developing uh, initiatives. What, uh, what initiatives can we, can we work on? What actions can we take to help solve that problem? So first uh, came equipment, looking at what, what equipment do our, our forces need to be able to operate and what, how can we have a standardized list and help the DOD refine our equipping capabilities so that we can operate across the, uh, the, the spectrum of, of cold weather from everywhere from freezing down to the, the temperatures of negative 60 which you uh, have to overcome in the Arctic. Second is uh, sustainment. How do we sustain our forces? Not only if we had to do uh, a homeland defense scenario in, in the Arctic, but also looking at, uh, as, as we're talking on the domestic side, with uh, spill response. If there is a spill or a disaster in the Arctic, how are we going to sustain our, our forces? There are no, unlike the rest of the United States, uh, in Alaska, for example, the, up on the North Slope, there's, there's no real infrastructure. There's very few airports. The towns and communities that are up there, I mean, we're talking two, four, four hundred, three hundred, maybe a couple thousand people in the larger communities. If you descend 500 people into a town of 200, uh, can that town sustain that, uh, that force of responders? No. So how would, we, how would we be able to do that? Same thing if we were going to deploy the same force for uh, a, a military re reason. So looking at how do we sustain our forces for a longer period of time in the, in the Arctic. Uh, then looking at the, at the response, looking at a, a domestic response, what type of capabilities do us as states have, and how can we, how can we better prepare ourselves and standardize the, the equipment, the training, the, uh, the, the packages, the response packages that we have so that we can respond quickly to any type of domestic emergency type response in the Arctic. Now, and lastly, our last initiative that we looked at was a, is an exercise, which segues great into, into Arctic Eagle, but it's the Arctic Eagle exercise, which ties all of these together, which gives us an ability to test that equipment, which gives us ability to rehearse those sustainment procedures, which gives us ability to evaluate uh, whether or not our domestic response capability is, is up, to, up to muster. Sir? You were doing fine. I was just going to let you keep going. And then, I was, <laughs> then I didn't even have to stand up and say anything. I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, 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 disclaimer up front, two weeks on the job. So uh, I just took over for my counterpart. So uh, please uh, back me up, Aaron, if I say anything uh, incorrectly. Um, uh, as Adam said, Arctic Eagle, uh, an exercise, just bottom line up front. Uh, started in Michigan. We took it over a couple of years ago. Um, and under our tag's direction was to kind of make this a, um, the way forward is a kind of a capstone exercise for what we're trying to accomplish with our member states in the Arctic. And as Adam said, it's uh, basically to, uh, as the execution arm of this, ex uh, this exercise, is to uh, uh, garner support um, from, our, uh, from our MAGCOMs uh, and uh, Alaskan Command, Northern Command, try and uh, synergistically tie other exercise to exercises together um, work uh, in the, within the 
constructs of Ar Arctic Eagle and kind of make it this uh, all-encompassing um, uh, exercise where uh, states, nations, anybody could come and, uh, you know, our, our end goal is to d identify these, uh, um, these gaps in capability and then you know, with the after action reports and everything, fix, fix this, uh, fix those items. Um, but uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be in Alaska. The last one was in Alaska here in um, 16? 18. 18, my bad. Um, uh, and that is a uh, basically um, an exercise where uh, folks do come up to uh, play and you move all the equipment, all the personnel, uh, in this case, to Alaska. Every off year will be kind of a, um, an, a tabletop exercise and a kind of a planning event for the next year. So every two years, uh, we'll do a, an all-in exercise. Uh, the challenges that came with this and this last one is, is basically, as mentioned, is getting some of these rapid response teams and everybody uh, to the fight, uh, to Alaska. Um, uh, you know, we had a very, uh, needed to rely heavily on uh, airlift to, to get it to the, uh, that part of the world. So, so those are some of our challenges, along with the things uh, mentioned. So uh, logistics is, uh, I think, the biggest piece we need to work out um, once, we get to the, uh, once we get to the area and then um, uh, proceed from there. Any, any other items to fill in on Arctic Eagle? Now, anything else? That, okay. So, so if I could add a comment, uh, thank you. Great, uh, great comments in, in response to the question, and thank you, uh, Sherry, for the question. I, I would also uh, comment that you know there's some things that we can do as leaders in our own states uh, to test our own ability, and, and and so in that respect, we're kind of like a laboratory. So, you know, to go out in the middle of summer in Wisconsin is a whole different kind of annual training than going out in the middle of winter in Wisconsin. And maybe, you know, I can't dig a foxhole, but, you know, my soldiers can in, in the cold. That kind of thing, <laughs> some things we can do. Another example is we do uh, collaborative training with first responders to make sure that our equipment and our expectations uh, are going to work the same, whether it's 80 degrees and sunny or minus 35. We just did this with a communications exercise in the dead of February, and it was brutal. A whole different kind of thing to try and set equipment up when you've got to take your gloves off and try to get that equipment to work. So in that respect, uh, we can help uh, sort of every state sort of like a laboratory feeding information to the Defense Department on things that may be important for the Army and the Air Force and the other services, but we deal with the two, the Army and the Air Force only uh, as a National Guard. I also want to mention the role of the National Guard Bureau. So the Chief of the National Guard Bureau has got a unique role as a channel of communication for the non-federalized National Guard and for that part that's going to be developed for the National Guard of the United States when we're on active duty. So we will work, in fact, we'll, we'll be at the Pentagon this afternoon working with the National Guard Bureau staff on a whole panoply of issues that we've talked about. But they're really our portal to try and influence that conversation. And of course, the Defense Department's got a huge role in trying to figure out priorities in a very difficult environment. It's got a big budget, but it's never enough to do all the things it has to do. So you're in this competition as we go forward. So we can help uh, advocate the issue, and we can help advocate thoughts on how we might prepare for it and things like uh, Arctic Eagle and different exercises. Thank you. And, and sir, I'd just like to, like to add, you know, in our states, you know, we, we, we're really, this Arctic Interest Council is about the message. It's about the narrative. And in our states, we do what we can. When, when you look at the northern tier states, in Pennsylvania, we had three major winter storms in March. We deployed over 3,000 soldiers in the snow in a cold weather environment working for you know, up to, up to a week, you know, these are on state active duty, and they do this on a regular basis. So we have a lot of expertise right here within the National Guard, and I think that message is so important that we send, and I think that is part of our, our charter. Mm -hmm. Could I just observe maybe at the last? Please, Sherry, sure, if you just use the microphone. Thank what you. What I hear you saying is that um, as a result of changing weather, call it extreme weather, disruptive events, climate force events, whether it's in the Arctic or storms in Pennsylvania or the hurricane train that came through, we're having to deploy our forces in new and different ways that require additional training equipment and sustainment than we have had to do, uh, you know, even 10, 15 years ago. Well, that's for sure. <clears throat> and there's no end in sight. And um, this is a grassroots effort. This is a grassroots um, uh, 
colloquium. And we also have, of, of the 54, we have uh, hurricane interest groups, we have earthquake interest groups, and we really get at the, um, the nug work of making sure that we are prepared as, as states to come to our own defense first and then to help to reach out to other states and for them to, to know what is the package that they're going to ask for and what is the funding mechanism, how do we make it as smooth as possible. And um, right now we're, we are working um, through the Council of Governors with, in collaboration with the Department of Defense to determine um, can there be a, a federal mechanism for funding such that a state with deficit issues, a state that doesn't have the budget to pay up front for their own National Guard forces to deploy in support of another state, is there another way to do it so that states don't put themselves uh, financially at risk for coming to the aid as individual states with individual states. So it's a, an important thing on our plates right now. And uh, General Dunbar and I have governors. No, you're not in the Council of Governors, but he's, he's definitely in the conversation. Uh, but, but there are 10 states, 10 adjutants general that are involved in those discussions right now on behalf of the Council of Governors, which is part of the National Governors Association. One of the things that's a little unique about the Guard is that it's kind of the deal we have with the folks in our state and our governor. One of the, you know, the headline when it's big storm heading, governor calls up the National Guard. It's just expected that the Guard will be there and that we'll have capabilities mm -hmm. uh, wherever they are, whether it's the hurricane, it's the earthquake, or, um, and we want to just make sure part of the purpose of this council is to make sure that when those events take place in that extreme cold weather climate, that they can expect us to be there just like we are for everything else. In fact, the motto of the National Guard is always ready, always there. And um, as so I spent 30 years on active duty in the active component and didn't understand the Guard, didn't really appreciate the Guard. Uh, now I get it. Uh, just like there's nothing worse than a reformed smoker. Um, <laughs> I, I, I understand now uh, when someone says that they're a state trooper or they're a history professor or they own their own family business, and yet they also wear our nation's cloth and serve their state. It's, it's really kind of mind-boggling. Um, and so these are conversations that are very important to the states, and, and it's complicated work, right? Because it's state-to-state, uh, state, it's state-to-federal, DOD is involved, FEMA is involved, Department of Homeland Security, and so there's nothing easy uh, about any of this work. And so we're always looking for ways to be able to come to the aid of other states more quickly and more effectively. Thank you. Well, well maybe we can add, maybe efforts like this can add a third line to uh, always ready, always there. Perhaps we can help with always funded. <laughs> can't promise a thing uh, we, we have many friends that watch online and so as I've been fuddling with my, my phone here uh, it's because we have friends uh, from Alaska and elsewhere asking me to ask this panel questions so they're using my personal cell phone <laughs> so that's either really good or really bad I don't know which one yet and I'm impressed that they're up No, they're, good for you I, Alaska no, no kidding uh, this is from our friend Cam Carlson, who's at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and does a lot on, on uh, Arctic policy but domain awareness. And, and he would like to ask the question, and then I will turn to the audience, of the panel, whomever. How could the ties between the Guards, Arctic uh, Interest Council, ALCOM, and NORTHCOM, and the Academy be improved? And I know Cam is trying to thread the University of Alaska's capacity with not just the state of Alaska and the Arctic, but also cold weather operations and preparedness across, I think, what this council represents. The academy. The university's higher education, the academy. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, first of it, uh, uh, the first thing is that we're not, we should not be afraid of one another uh, and that we should uh, open the lines of communication and collaboration. And so I hope it's not weird for us to be here in these uniforms talking about this. And, uh, and, and we want, uh, we, want as, we need as many partners as we can get. And one of the things that we need to be able to do is open our aperture and, uh, and, and broaden our worldview 
so that we can um, be efficient and effective. And, and by that, I mean that there are many instruments of national power. And so where we can connect uh, military um, effectiveness in, in new ways to, to diplomatic efforts, to informational efforts, to, to economic efforts, I think that, uh, that we, ought to, um, we ought to explore that. If I could add. Um, Please. <clears throat> I think that the council forms the right piece as a vehicle to establish those relationships. Mm. Um, as, as an example, the U.S. Army Alaska is the test bed for cold weather equipment. And um, just understanding that there are 18 states in the, in the National Guard that have an interest in this and that the council becomes a vehicle to get a foot in that door and get a seat at that table as they review equipment and test um, product that will support future mission, I think is an important piece. Um, I think the, the future council meetings will become a vehicle in which the NORTHCOM can come and address its force that is going to be the responding force inside of their strategic plan and stuff like that. I think that's very important. And I think, um, you know, having the council form first and then brought into that process allows us to establish a level of, of membership that will, you know, allow us to help steer the direction of those conversations rather than just being the receiving end of it. So. Let me go to something I think is, is just a little more base and the root of many of our evils. So here's an example. Black Rapids Training Center, which is the Northern Warfare Training Center, is run by the active component. It's run by U.S. Army Alaska. And uh, my counterpart at USARAC and my battle buddy, Major General Mark O'Neill, uh, we've had conversations, as did I with his predecessor, Major General Brian Owens, about um, how can we embed Alaska National Guard soldiers. Uh, we, we have indigenous peoples. We have Alaska Native peoples who are in our formations who are the preeminent experts on not only uh, surviving but thriving in the Arctic. And so we started to talk about how could we get this done and the rules of funding and the, the, the rules that govern what we can do with our soldiers and airmen and, and what they have to do were so cumbersome that at some point all these good ideas just go to the grave for, for um, the, the headbutting that we constantly seem to do against our, our own rules. And so uh, if I, you know, my fantasy here is that uh, we make it easier for ourselves to operate um, as, as a National Guard and especially with regard to our other components. And um, like you said, Norway has a facility so that a person in uniform can go from component to component to component. Oh no, not, not us, you know, it's, it's much, much, much more difficult in our own system. So we just have to be more agile. Uh, we have to be more proactive and, and we have to um, be able to get out of our silos of excellence and, uh, and not be afraid to think of new ways and, and just reducing the time and the red tape uh, and the rules of doing business among our components. And even within the National Guard, having an Arctic Interest Council allows us, a National Guard of 54, to speak with one voice. And I find that to be very important just within the National Guard uh, ecosystem. It, I find that to be very important. As we look at different recommendations that are being made, rather than each state headquarters putting in th what they like or what they think is important, if we work it through the Arctic Interest Council, I think we speak with one voice. And that's really what I think Guard Bureau would like to have, and I think our, 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 the DOD would like to have. Any other comments on this from the panel? Okay. How about another question from the audience? Grant Ackerman's coming down. Grant from Fairbanks is our, uh, is our summer scholar intern. Grant, thank you. Thank you. A great gathering of uh, intelligence. My name is Charles Botwick. I'm from the private sector. I've worked extensively with uh, actually uh, critical infrastructure and base camps and cold weather environments. And a very interesting personal note is my father served in the cold weather research lab at Natick and the U.S. Army during World War II. 
and in fact, it's on his gravestone. <laughs> Quite unique. Uh, I used to work uh, also from the private sector with the White House uh, Office of Science Technology Policy, uh, with technology development from the private sector and how to get more of the private sector involved all the time. Uh, I had the great privilege to meet and work with the TAG in West Virginia, uh, Major General James Hoyer and uh, Colonel Randall Isom. And, uh, a good case in point, there's a big uh, formerly used uh, coal mining area called the Holbet site. And the uh, Guard is taking a footprint to put a training center there. And part of it relates to an ultimate economic development goal, partnering, and also a technology incubator. So I know the, the core, USACE has a coal weather lab, I guess, in Hanover, New Hampshire. That's correct. Um, my question is, uh, in all of this in initiative and in talking about uh, development and so on, uh, is the Guard involved, say, in the Alaskan region, in the Arctic, involved in developing a sort of place that would be an incubator along with the private sector for cold weather research and for companies to actually uh, become resident and help to build up uh, both uh, new tech testing and also economic development for the area. Thank you. Well, it's an excellent thought. Um, and we do have some labs. Uh, Krell has a cold, uh, cold weather, cold weather engineering lab up in uh, near Fort Wainwright. Uh, the Corps of Engineers has some labs as well. Uh, we hadn't, uh, sorry, Fort Wainwright is, is near Fairbanks. <clears throat> the old Ladd Army Airfield from the from the Lend Lease days has become Fort Wainwright. Um, it, it's an excellent idea, and um, it's something that we should look into. But at this point, no, it's not something that we have thought of developing. Um, but an excellent idea. Right, and I'd be happy to talk to all of our University of Alaska uh, persons who are we, listening. We can make in. that happen. Let's, make, <laughs> let's start that conversation. That would be wonderful. Uh, another question here on my left. Thank you, Grant. Thank you for being here. It's very impressive to be in this room with all this brain trust that we have here, Michael, and you've done an excellent job with this. I want to muse for about 30 seconds, and then I, I have my question. But I've been to Russia a number of times, and I've only been there, and I've never seen grass in Russia. It's always been uh, zero uh, and nine days in a row, minus 38. So I know what it means to be there and actually be on equipment trying to move across that tundra. And it is brutal. It is really brutal. But uh, take this another step. I know that there, we have these uh, states to countries and other nations uh, experience and also relationships, which I think is fantastic. So we hear your message and kind of underlining is that we have to do a lot more than what we've been doing. Uh, but at the same time, we have these tremendous uh, assets among these other nations, uh, which are part of the Arctic Council. Uh, it seems like we have a lot of these, uh, we have actual formal relationships. So how do we take those assets and that brain trust and weave it into a narrative, but also in reality of where we're actually protecting the homeland of the United States. But these homelands, which are very vulnerable, just like Canada, you know, and uh, Greenland and other places, and how do we tie all this together so that we're, uh, we're leveraging assets and America's not doing it alone, we're not trying to finance it alone, which we realize in today's world we just no longer can do that. But thank you for being here, your service to the country, and taking care of all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe perhaps before I open it up, I would just say, are you thinking something along, you could just nod, are you thinking something along the lines of uh, the Coast Guard's Arctic, uh, Arctic Forum, something along those lines? Okay. Thank you. Well, I, I will throw it. I, mean, I, I don't know specifically all the things we can do. I, I Just from my perspective, um, what the 
what we bring, and actually maybe even what the United States brings is we, we tend to talk about how we maybe aren't ready or we got all these things to do, but one of the things I think that is positive or encouraging, uh, and we talked about relationships, the relationship with Norway and our other state partnerships, and and things like the Arctic Circle, the Council that are you know not military related, it's people talking, and, and one of the strengths that the United States have is in general, the partnerships, the other people that we work with, and, and why do people work with us, and why do people work with NATO, why are countries aspiring to be part of NATO? Uh, it's because of the values that we bring to the table. And at the end of the day, when you start looking at how all the countries in the world are going to interact in that ungoverned territory, I think more people want to be on the side of the folks that have the right values. And so this week, we didn't just talk about uh, the military capability and sustaining and the equipment we needed. We talked about uh, a lot of the geopolitical uh, uh, forces that are in, in at play, and we talked about indigenous people, and we talked about uh, climate change and the effect on the people and the effect on the on the world uh, uh, environment and economies. So, uh, at the end of the day, when we're all working together, that's what I think it ends up being: is uh, whose side do you want to be on? Uh, the side that that cares about all these other things and these values, or the side that's looking for um, something else. This may seem a bit off off Arctic topic, but <clears throat> but bear with me. In uh, May of 2017, the Alaska National Guard hosted the uh, Pacific Command, now Indo-Pacific Command, but the Pacific Command's Environmental Security Forum. And we had representatives there from, tell me how many countries, 17, 18 countries, and, and it was all about um, in environmental impacts to, uh, to country and regional stability. And there were a lot of, um, obviously, a lot of Pacific nations there. And so the, um, the increase of, of sea level and saltwater inundation, et cetera, got uh, a lot of, of the attention. But, <clears throat> but the important thing here is there were, not only, there were military people who came. There were also people from, uh, from the, the public sector, uh, from you know, the government organizations, from uh, environment, natural resources. We also had private sector partners who participated. And there was a great sharing of ideas. Yes, this particular uh, forum happened to be sponsored by the United States government. And it was part of the theater security cooperation plan of then PACOM. One of the problems with uh, getting after increased security in, in the Arctic from the U.S. government and from DOD perspective is, I'm sure you're familiar with the combatant commands, the geographic combatant commands, and who has uh, responsibility for various areas. Well, until recently, <clears throat> the seams of three different combatant commands came together in the Arctic region. It was uh, PACOM, Northern Command and Europe, Europe Command, or UCOM. And so now they've kind of rejiggered the lines, and PACOM has moved a little bit um, off uh, the area, but now we have the, the, the uh, juncture of, of two different combatant commands. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if NORTHCOM and UCOM could work together with the other Arctic nations to sponsor uh, an environmental security forum of the Arctic? And the problem that, uh, that existed more in the past, but, but even so today, is who, who's responsible for, for looking at and for considering the Arctic? And it hasn't been clearly under one combatant commander's umbrella. Thank you. Other comments? I would just add, I think that uh, <coughs> General Hall makes a great point about the combatant commanders, because all of those partnerships that we engage in as states uh, now, mine's in Nicaragua, Wisconsin, so it's not very uh, <laughs> extreme cold weather. But all of those partnerships are uh, collaborated with the combatant commander uh, in his or her particular area of responsibility to make sure that we're benefiting uh, the very things you talk about and bringing in, when you bring the National Guard in, often you bring in things like the university and private sector that can help <coughs> in some of those lines of effort. Uh, so it is a, it is a place where we... Uh, we don't just go over as a state and set up our own program. It is an absolute collaboration with the Defense Department and the combatant commanders to make sure we get the best value for the public investment. So I would add as well, <clears throat> our state partnership is with uh, the country of Mongolia. And uh, as much as uh, we assist them in our, our visits, uh, we learn from them as well. Um, but the state partnership program could 
probably be leveraged more successfully if there was then a sharing mechanism, because what we learned from the Mongolians is not necessarily shared uh, with other states who partner with other countries who have the, the challenges and the situation that does Mongolia. So Mongolia is part of the uh, Indo-PACOM um, area, and so we, because we are funded through the Combatant Command, uh, when we have our state partnership meetings um, and, and our engagements with the, the other states who have partners in the PACOM area of responsibility, um, the, the, the lessons that we learn and the issues that we uh, confront with, with our Mongolian partnership are not necessarily germane to a country who's partnering with Sri Lanka, for example. And so um, y your point that you, uh, it, maybe it was implicit or you just uh, sent it over the brainwaves is really well taken that we have this, um, we have this theater security cooperation plan and the state partnership uh, plan, but it's not necessarily aligned to best effect writ Pangea. Thank you. We have uh, about five more minutes, so let me take another question or two here on my left. Thank you, Grant, and then back up on my left is to the next one. Please. Hi, Dave Arzold from the National War College. Thank you for being here. Uh, my question is, what's your role and in input in NORTHCOM strategy development, and what would you like it to be? Thank you. I'm looking down to the folks in my J5 Grant, because we, we have you? had input with Microphone NORTHCOM. Down. Oh, sorry, we got one. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Thank you. So our biggest input to, to NORTHCOM, as far as Arctic strategy goes, is we are a char or we are on the Arctic Capability Advocacy Working Group Charter, which is where they basically advocate for or on how to fill or the capability gaps that they see for Arctic operations. So <clears throat> with on that charter, we also interact with ALCOM and USARAC to kind of help advance our, all of our equities on what we think need, needs to be done in the Arctic to make sure that we are capable to, to, to respond. I'll say, though, that it comes down to um, what is a combatant commander required to do, right? Combatant commanders have so many competing requirements, and so if they're told to develop a contingency plan, a contingency plan is a, a plan that is a second or third echelon. It might happen. We don't think necessarily it will happen, and so it doesn't necessarily come with resourcing. And so until a, an O plan for the Arctic is, is mandated, um, in the National Defense Authorization Act, um, we, we won't necessarily get to the next steps of fulfilling the requirement to plan and then, and then resource and, um, and, and follow through for uh, execution. Great. Thank you. I think my left. Thank you, Grant. Uh, good morning. Hans Benendijk. Uh, Rand Corporation today, former government official. I wanted to follow up on the, the question about Russia. Um, I was up in uh, Svalbard a couple of weeks ago and uh, spent a day with the Norwegian uh, Coast Guard, and I was very impressed by the extent to which they cooperate on an hourly basis with, uh, with the Russian Coast Guard. Uh, fisheries enforcement, um, search and rescue. D that's despite the fact that there is no NATO ally that is tougher on Russia in terms of deterrence than, than Norway. Um, and if you now take that to uh, the Bering Sea, this is perhaps more Coast Guard than a National Guard question, but it strikes me that there are a, a number of scenarios uh, in that area. Uh, uh, search and rescue operations, other humanitarian disasters where we might actually be able to benefit from uh, cooperation with Russia, maybe one of the few areas where we can. Uh, we have a, a summit coming up with President Trump and President Putin. I'm just wondering if there isn't some opportunity here uh, to explore this, to see, I, I don't know if the National Guard has MOUs with Russia for certain kinds of contingencies, but I'm just wondering if there isn't an opportunity there. 
So if I could phone a friend right now, it would be Rear Admiral <laughs> Matt Bell, who's the commander of uh, Coast Guard District 17, which, uh, which is Alaska. And I don't want to speak for him, but I can relate some stories that he and his uh, predecessors, Rear Admiral Mike McAllister and before him Rear Admiral Dan Abel, um, have, have told me stories about remarkable tactical level cooperation uh, between the Russians and the U.S. Coast Guard and even between the U.S. Coast Guard and the Chinese. And so I, I honestly think that regardless of um, what's happening at the federal level or what the agreements say that we, um, that we can or can't do or should or shouldn't be doing, when it, especially when it comes to uh, saving of lives, that uh, at the tactical level there's a remarkable degree of cooperation um, I can say we have no memorandum of understanding for uh, National Guard operations vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, hadn't thought in that, um, in that direction because even though from one Diomede Island to the other you can see Russia on a clear day, uh, you know, our, our, our ground forces don't come together certainly uh, not like in the in the international water space where you know we have um, we have opportunities to to work together and I'm gonna I'm gonna look to Colonel Bolin because he was uh, formerly the operations group commander of the 176th wing with a, a vast responsibility for search and rescue uh, in the Alaska airspace Tom you want to add to Yes, ma'am. So uh, we have interacted with Russia at times. If you know, um, uh, along with our Coast Guard brethren, we have uh, the Air Force. And under the uh, auspice of the uh, Alaska National Guard, we, uh, with 12 National Guardsmen, uh, basically run the rescue coordinate, Alaska Rescue Coordination Center. So responsible for uh, the landmass of Alaska, lakes, rivers, and streams, in conjunction with District 17, who does pretty much the Aleutian chain and, and South Central and then offshore. Then the guard has everything out uh, past 200 miles just due to our capabilities. So uh, we have interacted with Russia at times. Um, uh, in, in my tenure, maybe two instances when we had, uh, I think we had a, a gentleman in a rowboat going from one side to the other and uh, basically got in trouble right there in the middle of the strait. So uh, that was the rescue that we conducted. Uh, and, and again, the conversations go on. Uh, up until just prior to 9-11, um, we did um, uh, basically, uh, with Russia, uh, exercise uh, SAR Xs, SAR exercises with them. And also, one of our last one was with um, uh, Hong Kong SARX. So uh, we are uh, kind of, uh, you know, as uh, the general said, uh, search and rescue is kind of near and dear to our hearts and kind of brings everything together. So in answer to an earlier question, our Canadian brethren are, are even more um, uh, in tune with us on that. And uh, as the, uh, the cruise ship was going around, uh, the um, Crystal Serenity, uh, basically we used that as an opportunity to potentially get together and we, what we did, Arctic Chinook, um, uh, we, uh, and I, I shortchanged our Arctic Eagle because we were everywhere from 200, uh, uh, 200 miles north of uh, Dead Horse on the ice cap with the United States Navy Arctic sub labs, dropping equipment, um, exercising uh, Arctic sustainment packages, life-saving packages. The, uh, the Canadians have something called a MAGE-Aid, which is uh, pretty big, uh, able to sustain about 300 folks if it's all dropped at once. We have a smaller version, modular version of that package. But uh, we take those opportunities to um, exercise that. Back to the equipment question, I think um, in the private sector, uh, we see the private sector reaching out to specific units and entities, at least in the Alaska, uh, within the active duty and uh, in the guard to say, hey, you guys want to try out this equipment? This is uh, pretty good stuff. What do you think? I think the interest council will basically help us, you know, consolidate that effort in one voice so that we can, we can you know, check those things out and focus our capability, our, our um, uh, basically, uh, our efforts in, in uh, a consolidated vice, uh, wasting all this time going to different, uh, different entities and checking stuff out. So we are, uh, we are in play, but ag again, I think the council and everything it stands and, and can uh, basically uh, focus our energies will bring us all together so that when we're reaching out to Alaskan Command, Northern Command, uh, we have a set, uh, a generated set of priorities. Uh, we're moving forward in exercises. Uh, we're formalizing all those uh, and prioritizing, synchronizing. 
not wasting taxpayer dollars on uh, 10 exercises when we can do one exercise and, and kind of do the whole thing at once. Thank you. We're running out of time. I want to ask the panel if there's anything else you would like to add to the issues that we've discussed here this morning. You don't have to. <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> let, me, let me just try to wrap up here in a little bit. First of all, thank you all very much on the panel, front row here, for communicating to all of us what it is that you're trying to do and why, what those challenges are. But it's pretty clear to me that this is needed. It's forward-leaning. Um, and, and I would like to invite you back at some time that of our mutual choosing here, perhaps a year from now or whenever, to touch base back on what has happened since we spoke today and, and see where we are on that. So I'd ask for you to entertain that. I'd, I want to work uh, backwards here a bit in terms of the bearing. Uh, you know, the IMO approved a, uh, an agreement between Russia and the United States for transportation in the Bering Strait. That's very positive. That shows cooperation between the two. The Arctic Coast Guard Forum obviously works quite well, uh, not related to the Arctic Council, but they discuss often uh, with the Arctic Council their their efforts, and so I think a couple of these questions we're asking once this is up and moving and you are working towards your, your, your mission and your vision and you're meeting some of your goals, might there be the opportunity to, to again work aside from Norway and Mongolia but with, with the other seven Arctic nations and what, what might that look like? That would be a very interesting thing to follow up on and any way that we can help you to do that, we'd be uh, happy to do so. Um, I, I think that not just from an Alaskan perspective but from a a U.S. citizen's perspective, the idea that our guard has to be there all the time and prepared for all of the issues you deal with, uh, but then also th leaning forward a great deal on this issue of Arctic and cold weather, cold climate operations is, is really quite settling to me because not many areas of our government think this way. This over the, I mean, we think about what's in front of us often and we do plan out ahead but to actually have leaders thinking about ways in which they can have interoperability, that mission, vision, and capability is, is wonderful. Generally, you talked about transporting stuff that goes beyond just the equipment. I think you're, you're talking about transporting expertise and sharing expertise and knowledge in these areas, all very helpful uh, and, and needed. And I want to thank you all very much for at least today sharing with us a little peek into where you're going in any way in which we can help you advance this agenda, we would be most happy to do so. So would you all please thank the panel for their wonderful discussion this morning. And thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.